Associate, oh, there it is. Associate Missioner for Latino Hispanic Ministries and Program Development wow. for the Episcopal wow. Church. Wow. Yes. Wow. Yes. Oh, wow. Yes. Took me like six months to learn my title. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So I'm Samuel Borbon, uh, Associate Missioner for Latino Ministry, and it's always hard to present myself as part of the presiding bishop stuff because people have, you know, the presiding bishop, and no pressure at all. <laughs> told me, oh, the presiding bishop was here. Yes. Bishop Patrick was here. Yes. And yeah. now you're here. <laughs> <laughs> so every time that I introduce myself and I talk to and I say I work for the presiding bishop, people are expecting like <laughs> I'm an introvert. <laughs> so. <laughs> uh, if you really want to know who I am, <laughs> okay. I'm not just that long, big title, but this is who I am. Uh, I'm a dad. Uh, I have three kids. Uh, she's she's five. No, six. <laughs> Thanks God, my wife is not here. <laughs> Uh, Samuelito and Isabella. Oh. So those are my three kids. And this is who I am. I perform as, as the Associate Missioner for Latino Ministry. And the conversation that we want to have today, I'm just going to do a presentation, no more than 20 minutes, hopefully, so we can start a conversation regarding Latino Ministry here in Bend. So the way that I'm gonna do it, I'm just gonna present kind of what our office does in the Episcopal Church. Then I'm gonna jump into the reality of Ben. I have some information here that can guide us. So then we can start a conversation. So we have 377 congregations, Latino congregations or worship groups in the United States. That's not including province nine. Who can tell me which countries belong to province nine? You can. Not America, Samoa, not Hawaii. What? Let, 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 let me go back. Let me tell you the diocese that belong to the province nine. It's Puerto Rico, Dominican Republic, Colombia, Ecuador has two dioceses, and then we have also Honduras. So there are six countries, seven dioceses that belong to Province Nine, which is part of the Episcopal Church. Um, that doesn't mean that the Anglican Church is not present in Mexico. There's five dioceses in Mexico. There's also uh, what we call Yarca, uh, which is like the Anglican. Church of Central America, which includes Panama, El Salvador, um, Guatemala, Nicaragua, and Costa Rica. So the, the church is present in all over Mexico and the rest of Latin America. So the Episcopal Church, part of the Episcopal Church is Province 9. Cuba, who just returned to the Episcopal Church, belongs to the Province 2. So even though they're Spanish speaking, uh, they belong to province two. There's approximately six, 65,000 Latinos in the US. In the Episcopal Church, just 4% it's Latino. This is how the country looked 30 years ago, almost 40 years ago, in 1980, regarding Latino. The blue colors represent 24 percent, the, the percentage of Latinos around the country. So in 1980, just basically on the south, was where we could find Latinos. Do you know how the country looks now? <laughs> <laughs> Boom! 
a little different, huh? Yeah. This is from 2010. 30 years after, this is the change that we can see in the country. Latinos are the fastest growing um, group in the states. I'm sorry. We say that it's 51% of the population that is growing, it's Latino. This is around the United States. <coughs> if you can see something that is very important, one of the reasons that I do this is because sometimes we think that Latino ministry is just for those who speak Spanish. They don't speak English, that's why we have to do Latino ministry. And that's not completely true. 38 out of the 58.6 million of Latinos that there's in the country, wow, out of 325 million people in the United States, 58.6 are Latinos. So out of those 58 million, 38.4 were born in the United States. Wow, so that means that they go to the schools that our kids go, they speak the language that our kids normally speak, they know the culture, they can blend in the culture. But when Christmas is coming, they're having a big celebration because the family is coming. <laughs> when Dia de los Muertos is coming, they're going to have a big celebration because it's about family. It's about gathering together. That means that these kids are going to be celebrating in December, Las Posadas, and La Virgen, and all the fiesta that we always invent. <laughs> so, 34% of Latinos are immigrants. And especially right now, because of the political situation, that number is going down. Um, in 2000, in the year 2000, it was 40%. Now it's getting lower to 34%. We have less people coming from Latin America or Mexico, but we still have Latinos here reproducing. <laughs> I have three. <laughs> I was going to say, and working on it, but not, not, not <laughs> My hair is getting gray. I'm losing part of my hair. No, not anymore. So, this is a picture of how Latino ministry looks like. This is. <laughs> 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 this is one third of the population that we're focusing on Latino ministry represent just the Spanish speaking Latinos that we know. Those people that we think or that we know that are not part of the culture, it's just one third of the total population. Because 65% represent what we call the second, third, fourth generation Latinos. If you haven't heard that um, term, terminology of second, third generation Latinos, I'm a first generation Latino. I was born in Mexico, in the beautiful city of Mexicali, right on the border. So I'm not even completely Mexican or because <laughs> <laughs> I grew up celebrating Thanksgiving. I don't know why. It was just right in the order. And it was a celebration, but let's celebrate it. <laughs> but posadas were very important. Christmas was very important. Dia de los Muertos was very important. Quinceañeras, like I was a chambelán for so many quinceañeras. Because <laughs> I grew up on that, on the border, where we had the blend of the cultures. Second generation Latinos, my kids are second generation Latinos. That means mom and dad are Mexican, but they were born here in the States. 
So they speak the language. They know Spanish because we just, les hablamos en español en la casa. It's very important for us to keep our culture. But guess what? They go to school, they watch cartoons, they play with their friends, not in Spanish. Even sometimes for them, English is easier. It comes faster to them. But they love the fiestas. They're so attached to family. They, they have our culture. So that's what we call second generation Latinos. Their kids are going to be third generation, and so on and so on. So you're going to find people with the last name Gutierrez who are barely going to be able to speak Spanish, and they will still consider themselves Latinos. Of course, my mom or my grandma was to, like was from Mexico or was from El Salvador, and we learned all the culture. We love tamales, we love uh, tacos and pupusas and all of those kind of food. Like we are attached to our culture. This are the people that we sometimes in the church don't put attention to. And we think that they can just come to church in English. But guess what? No. Because they need some kind of, like, el sabor latino. <laughs> they need the music. They need some kind of, something that attach them to their culture. Because, of course, they learn the faith through their parents and to the language that speak on their heart. So that's Latino ministry. When we talk about Latino ministry, we, of course, we put attention in the first generation Latinos, the immigrants that are coming here, but we need to put more attention to this 65% who's already here and who works in banks and they're teachers, they're, they have like the normal jobs that we know. So Latino ministry is not just focused on immigrants who work on the field, who don't speak the language, who are poor. It's not outreach. I always say Latino ministry, it's not outreach. Latino ministry, it's invited, inviting people to come and be part of this family of the church. Especially because they know, they can blend. They know the culture. Their friends are gringos, they're, they're weros, they're white, so they know how to interact with them. I was looking at some statistics here in Ben, and I'm gonna jump to that. I'm, I'm using the resources from the church. There is a website that you can go and click on your congregation, put the name of the congregation, and it will give you the uh, radius of the people who live three miles around the church. But there's also uh, what we call Mission Insight. The, this is a, a nonprofit that do all kind of reports uh, regarding population, income, kids, everything that you can imagine, housing, um, so I went to Mission Insight and did a, did, a, did a report for Ben, just in general, and this is what I found. And the report was done in <coughs> September 3rd of 2018. So it's pretty current. <laughs> so it says that in Ben, we have almost 91,000 people. The average age is 39. <laughs> Which is good. And this is what I was mentioning during church. Birds, there were 1,018 on the last 12 months, 700 deaths, and look at the migration. 3,419 people are coming here from outside. Wow, I was, when I was reading it, I was like, wow! <laughs> I'm not saying that all of them are Latinos, 
<laughs> by no means. Yeah. No, but yesterday when I was at 7-Eleven and I was talking to the two guys that trusted me, <laughs> and they told me, oh, we just arrived last week. I was like, mm, you're part of those 3,000. <laughs> so I just need 3,417 to be able to see the rest of them. <laughs> so the pace of life, 28% uh, of the people here in Van are between 35 and 54 years old. 17% it's between the 5 and 17 and 65 or older it's 15%. So right at you, we have a lot of families here. We, la we have a lot of young people here. <coughs> <laughs> I'm willing to move. <laughs> and just for you to give an idea, 32% are blue collar jobs and 68% white collar jobs. Just this is just getting to know how Ben look, looks like. What about in the Latino side in Ben? The median income, race, and ethnicity, white. This is just a medium income. I know that you, maybe you're getting more than 50,000, 4,000. <laughs> but look at the difference. White people, their income is $54,000 a year. And Latinos, it's 48. If you make the math, we're just like 100 or $200 difference by paycheck, which is not too much. Sometimes we tend to think that, or we have those kind of ideas. Mm -hmm. Latino, pobre. Mm -hmm. I was going to say about work. I didn't say that. <laughs> They're recording right now. <laughs> so when we talk about Latinos, we are not just talk, we're not just talking about those poor people. We're talking about people who live in the same neighborhood that we live who drive kind of the same cars that we can that we may be driving, that have some jobs, kind of the ones that we all have. We're talking about professionals, too. Right here, I didn't write it here, but the report said that blacks here in, in Bend, their income was $200,000. And I was like, Wow, we should That's do ministry here. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the Office of Latino Ministry is part of the ethnic ministries of the church. Right here, you have the missionaries. This is, uh, I don't know if you can see the picture there. Ron Bird, he's the missionary for black ministries. Anthony Guillen, he's the missionary for Latino um, Hispanic ministries, and he's in charge of the ethnic ministries. Brock Half is a um, Indigenous Ministries, and Fred Vergara, it's the Missioner for Asian American Ministries. And of course, that's me. Ta -da! <laughs> and Angie, she's awesome. She, she's, she's kind of our mom for all this. <laughs> so, going back to Latinos in Bend, it says that 8.3 percent of the population here in Bend are Latinos. 6.3 are coming from Mexico. So we can say that most of the Latinos here come from Mexico. But this is very important. 4.8 Latinos speak Spanish at home. That means that 3.5 Latinos are speaking English at home. Wow, Latinos, I was saying <laughs> Latinos, that their first language is not Spanish. And that's where the name comes from. I was uh, yesterday having dinner with great people from here from the community. And, and I asked them, what's the difference between Latinos and Hispanics? Why do we call it Latino ministry? Well, we call it, honestly, we call it Latino Hispanic ministry. Because <laughs> <laughs> we're trying to be polite, but in 1968, the government decided to name those people who spoke Spanish and put the name Hispanics. 
and it was just for the census, to, to be able to make the census. So those people who were able to speak Spanish, who were coming from Spain or some kind of connection, um, the census decided to call them Hispanics. For Latinos, they didn't like the idea that the government was putting us into one box to be able to recognize us or to segregate us. I don't know what would be the right word. But we decided to call ourselves Latinos. Latinos are those who come from Latin America. In Latin America, you don't just speak Spanish. In Latin America, even the countries that speak Spanish, it's so different one from the other. I have been in, in like for a couple, I was in, in the DR, and I was using my Mexican language, and people were like, oh, what are you saying? <laughs> <laughs> Nothing. So then I learned that for me, something that it wasn't like bolsas, means bolsa, my pockets, didn't mean anything. For them, it was a bad word. It was something not nice to say in public. <laughs> and so, go, oh, oh. so even among Latinos, there is a lot of richness, a lot of diversity. Even the language. We have people in Latin America who speak Portuguese, English, French. And of course, we have so many indigenous that are that they speak their own dialects. That Spanish is their second language. And those are the people who are coming here and who are bringing all the diversity. And that's why we always call ourselves Latinos because we acknowledge and we love the diversity that is among us. Even though if we look the same, even if we have the same color of skin, even if we are chaparritos, if we're, we're Latinos. And Latino is not a culture. Latino is more a way of living life. And that's why we love to be called Latinos. Because that's the way we live life. And the <laughs> example that Father Jet was using, I was like, eight o'clock, bro, we're perfectly on <laughs> my my Latino time clock and boom. <laughs> I have been in wars. <laughs> so before going into the resources, Trinity, it's thinking on how can we be more sensitive? How can we approach? <coughs> how can we do ministry? with Latinos. And that's a conversation that we're here about to have. So I already had my 20 minutes. The next 20 minutes, <laughs> I'm just going to facilitate the conversation and the ideas that are, coming, that are going to come from you. How? And this is doesn't have to be realistic. <laughs> we can start by dreaming. Everything, most of the things, started by a dream. Can you imagine that guy who was thinking, how can I communicate with my novia, I don't know, my friend, who's so many miles away from me? How should I do that? And later on, cell phones came. <laughs> oh, well, not cell phones. In that time, it was phones. <laughs> Big <laughs> but everything started by dreaming. Martin Luther King, the famous Martin Luther King. I have a dream. And he was, the miracle was that he was able to share that dream. It wasn't the dream that he had. The miracle was he was able and he wasn't afraid to share that dream. So, why don't we start by sharing our dreams in Latino ministry? And I have a question. Celine. And it'll um, help figure out the dream. Part of the problem, that is a problem, in Central Oregon is very few 
very low number of population attend any church. So is it more in the Latino culture to attend the church on a regular basis for church services? Or would people be more interested in things we do that are not church services? Um, I know that you're asking the question to me, but I'm just going to pass it to the group. What's your experience, if you have an experience? I know that there's teachers here. I know that there's people who are working with Latinos. Um, I know that there's people who are connected to the Latino um, nonprofit that is here in Bend. What I know about Bend is that just two congregations, churches, mainline churches, are offering Latino Spanish services. The Roman Church at 1230, and the West Side, West Side. West Side. West Side Church at 10 o'clock, I think. So there's two services for 7,500 people. And the question is for all of us. Even if they aren't Latino masses, I know Latinos go to the Catholic, are Catholic, are really Catholic and they do go to the Catholic Church. I know the sister congre sisters' congregation is a very high Catholic community out there with lots of families. Mm -hmm. So they do, they are going to church. They're just not going to be here. So, so, I'm sorry, what's her name? Sorry, Caitlin. <laughs> Can we say that? That it's for the church, it's part of our culture as Latinos. I don't know. You tell me. <laughs> <laughs> this isn't an answer or question, it's an observation. You you mentioned several times the importance of both celebration and family in the Latino. Well, you said it's not a culture, but anyway, well, two Latinas, let's do it that way. Um, and so that makes me wonder whether a place, it makes me wonder whether a place to start for a church, and by the way, I've been a part of Trinity for a long time, and I have to say I believe Trinity loves diversity of ideas and people, and I love that. But anyway, where a place to start would be somehow to create something that was celebration and invited families to do that as opposed to going straight for a worship service in Spanish. I, and so that's my, I, I don't know. <laughs> what, if, what if Trinity hosted, and maybe this is already done by the Latin American community, I don't know, a celebration of the Dia, Dia de Muerto? <laughs> I just, after seeing the movie Coco, and our daughter-in-law, who is, you know, not, not even a tiny bit Latino, celebrates it in her own home. And what if we all, what if we open it up to the community? It's a wonderful celebration. We have music. People bring pictures of their family, maybe hang them up and around. Um, anyway. For Los Posados, too. What? Um, the Los Posados. Posadas? Yeah, Posadas is a wonderful celebration. It's Christmas time. Mm -hmm. Posadas, it's a... Uh, <coughs> well, let me tell you the real story of Posadas. Because <laughs> the way we celebrate Posadas, it's a fiesta. Yeah. That we do before Christmas, to, like, to prepare for Christmas. But the idea of the Posadas, the, the translation will be the inns. You know, when, G when Mary and Joseph were traveling, looking for a place for their baby to be born, and they were knocking doors, asking for posada, asking for an inn, for a place. So the posadas come from the Bible, like they're rooted in the Bible, saying Mary and Joseph are looking for a place for Jesus to be born, and we're knocking on doors, people's families, doors, so they can welcome us and Jesus can be born there. Oh, that's that's that. a tradition. Mm -hmm. And there are songs, and uh, it's, a, it's a beautiful tradition. But it also involves fiesta. It also involves sweet bread, piñatas. Um, it, it's a fiesta. It's a celebration um, of receiving Jesus 
which invited Jesus to be born in my home, in my family. That's a posada if you're not familiar with. Uh, I used to be a Roman Catholic, and uh, although I wasn't born a Catholic, but part of our children's program was Los Posados. And so we had a uh, school attached to our church, as you know, so many Catholic churches have. But out in the courtyard is where we celebrated the Las Posadas. And uh, we would go to a pretend door, and there would be people behind the door, and they'd slam the door in your face and say, we have no room. And then it would go on like that, and we would sing, and, and there were songs going on. And then we would end up in the hall where we had the fiesta. And we had, you know, the uh, piñatas and all the wonderful food. And, and because it was in Orange County, California, there we had a large um, uh, Latino uh, group of people that surrounded us. So we had a number of people in that community. Um, but it was mostly our gringos in the parish that held this. And our children just loved it. And they, you know, so a child was chosen to be Mary. A child was chosen to be uh, Joseph. and. Uh, the animals and it was just the whole thing and we made it into a very big celebration and our kids look forward to it every year. Oh. Thank, you. Thank, you. Thank you Linda. Before coming up with you, I just want to say part of my job as the Associate Missioner for Latino Ministry is to protect you and Latinos to start something that we're not ready for. <laughs> There's so many congregations that sometimes because of the priest who says, oh no, we're gonna start Latino ministry here. And they start and it becomes chaos. It becomes like a big issue. Because the congregation sometimes is not ready. Latinos are gonna bring family. Families have kids. <laughs> I have three. <laughs> Six, five, and two. <laughs> So if you're used to be on a very quiet service, and <laughs> having Latinos there, it doesn't mean that we have to have it together. It doesn't mean that we have to to have the same service. This is going to be crazy being a bilingual service, going back and forth. If I was trying to speak here Sp Spanish, going back and forth, most of you were going to be like, ya callate, ya stop, like, <laughs> you're making me crazy here. <laughs> It's something that not for all people work on that way. So we need to be sensitive also to the people who are here. Are they ready to share this space? And not just share this space, but to bring into our family of Trinity more people with different ways <laughs> to say it in a way. So that's why I was so interested in coming here and having this conversation because in, in my, it's my responsibility to protect this congregation but also to protect the people who are coming. That sometimes we bring people into a conflict and, and it just creates something that it's not healthy for anyone. So I, she raised her hand and then there was another hand over there. I'm, I'm just raising my hand to promote next month's second Sunday seminar. Which is Shameless. <laughs> yeah. 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 So, if you don't make it to the silent movie tonight, make it to the noisy movie next month. <laughs> and as a Latino, I'm going to say that movie of Coco, it's great. It's great. It's not just the Hollywood movies that we kind of hate. No, that's great to show what Dia de los Muertos is about. It's, it's, gonna say, it's about family. It's about coming together. So if you can, please, and I'm not going to be here not promoting it, but it would be great if you can be at that movie. <laughs> so we have another. So um, a, a couple of observations. First, your comments about family are very well taken. Yeah. And you probably, if, if you haven't noticed already, the parishioners of Trinity are not in the center demographic of Van <laughs> 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 and, uh, I think one of the things that we need to think about as a congregation is how do we grow and how do we bring more families in 
generally, regardless of culture, background, upbringing, you know, language, just, and that's a challenge that I think we face, and all churches face, in terms of growing and thinking about the future. But then I'm also, I'm, I'm a little puzzled with the math, and I'm doing it in my head, so tell me if I'm wrong. So you said there's 56 million Latinos in the United States? 58.6. 58, okay. And 65,000 Episcopalians, so that's like 1%, 1.3%, something like that? Of <laughs> I think that we said that it was 3%. 4% of Latinos okay. in the U.S. Hmm. Well, that, okay. it's, it's 4% of Episcopalians are Latinos, right. but not 4% of Latinos are Episcopalians. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> so, so, and, and, Mar my, my understanding was, in from wrong, is that most Latinos would be Roman Catholic. But I'd, I'd be curious as to what the religious distribution is of the Latino population in the U.S. And then I would pose this question to you and to the rest of the group is, if we really want to reach you know, the 7,000 Latinos in bed, but we're only going to successfully find 4% of those that would be comfortable as Episcopalians, should we be thinking about doing a community-wide, multi-church, uh, not outreach effort, but effort to bring these people to the church if they're not already attending? One of our, like the biggest experience that we, as an Episcopalians, Latino Episcopalians have working in Latino ministry, most of the Latinos <coughs> grew up in the Roman church. Most of them, when they find the Episcopal church, they're with their open eyes saying, wow, I was an Episcopalian so many years ago and I didn't know. <laughs> Like, I grew up in this tradition with, the, with all these boundaries, which I didn't feel com pretty comfortable. But I needed to follow it because it was, in Mexico, if you have this Mexico, Mexico, you were Roman Catholic or you're just Protestant. And Protestants are not, like, there's a question mark against Protestants. <laughs> like, oh, Protestants. So it's part of our culture that you have to be Roman Catholic. But when these people learn about the Episcopal Church, and it happened in my family, my brothers were like, wow, we're Episcopalians. Like, I haven't, my older brother actually would say, I haven't visited an Episcopal Church in Mexico. But every time that I come here and I go to the Episcopal Church, I feel like at home. Yeah. Like, this is my home. So I'm an Episcopalian. Even in Mexico, where I cannot <laughs> practice. <laughs> so our experience has been that most of the Latinos who come to the, who hear or discover the Episcopal Church, and sometimes that's the sad part of it, they have to discover it. That's that's a red light there. <laughs> so once they discover the Episcopal Church, they find home. Because right here, I'm able to, like, I have my traditional faith, but also I'm allowed to think, to ask questions, and why not to be different from, even from the priest. So that makes me feel welcome here. So our experience has been Latinos are most likely going to adopt the Episcopal Church once they discover it. That's our experience in our office. That's great news. <laughs> <laughs> there were so many heads that I don't remember. It was. I think that was. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, I, there are a couple of observations. First, I think the advantage of our tradition is that if, even if it's in another language, we kind of know the flow, and so we can. It, I think it's easier for us, perhaps, to assimilate another language because of our response. You know. Um, yeah, the, the liturgy, liturgy really mm -hmm. helps us with that. Um, number two, in terms of families, um, in the church I attend when I'm in Portland, um, once a month we have kind of like a family service, which is very casual. Uh, we have what's called wiggle rooms for the kids. They come up close to the to the altar, which is a table, and it's easy, very very family There's the um, it's kind of like an overhead, you know, so you can there's no bulletin, just kind of read like this um, how the service goes. 
Um, the songs are simpler than the kids' choir. There's all these things that are really incorporated with kids. And what, what you're talking about with the family and <coughs> Hispanic culture, something like that, I think, would fit in well with that, but also be something that was casual and fun and meaningful for the children of any ethnicity. And so it's, that's part of the thing about getting families in, is you have to make it accessible and make it easy for them. Okay, you can have your coffee while you're sitting in your chair like this. It's, it's just something that makes it, and it, it was a separate service. And we had folks who normally attended regular service attend that one too sometimes because it's fun. It's fun for older people um, my age, and, <laughs> and, and so, <laughs> and, and I enjoyed going to that service. How about my age? <laughs> To, three, to deal with three kids. She loves the family services that are offered in St. Michael's and all in Justin Portland, just as an example. And again, your name was? I'm Deb. I'm Deb. Deb. Uh, she was saying something very important. I'm here representing Latino, the Office of Latino Hispanic Ministries, so my conversation is coming through Latino Hispanic Ministries. But you're, you guys are so wise that I'm sure that you're not just thinking on Latinos. You're just think, you're seeing the wider picture yeah. and saying, someone mentioned it, like it seems like if the average range is 39, where are we there? <laughs> as, like a, as a congregation, what's our average age? <laughs> Maybe 42, 43. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, no, well, <laughs> <laughs> but there's a lot of people that we can reach. And I'm sure that you're thinking on that terms also. It's, it's almost 10 o'clock right now. Um, just, uh, I'm, I'm a resource here. In some other places, we always recommend, like, it's not the best way or the healthiest way to start just with a service. Yeah, that's mm -hmm. yeah. Um, because many reasons. So what we offer, it's funny, but most of our resources are in English. <laughs> yes, we're the Office of Latino Hispanic <laughs> Ministry, and most of the resources are in English, and our trainings, we have so many trainings in English for people to get to know our culture, for people to come and experience <coughs> what the Latino culture is about. So there's some, I'm just gonna put some examples. There are some congregations that have started with their <coughs> English speaking congregation adding just the readings, one reading in Spanish, mm -hmm. in the bulletin. Mm -hmm. It's gonna be read in English. Everything is gonna be normal just on the bulletin mm -hmm. is gonna be it's gonna be printed in Spanish. Oh. And that's the way they start. Mm -hmm. Later on they will discover they will discover that someone is coming because of that. Mm -hmm. Or someone is getting encouraged because of that. Mm -hmm. Or maybe now we're ready to learn more about. So some people just put the gospel. Some other pe some other congregations just start with the reading. First or second reading, just put it in Spanish for people to see it. Some other will just do the gospel. And again, you don't have to read it in Spanish. It's just going to be there for people to see it, to acknowledge that there's people who may be reading it in Spanish. And maybe some Anglos who learn Spanish 
And they were younger, they will come and say, oh, I remember, <laughs> they tried this. <laughs> and maybe someday later on, someone is going to say, why don't we just read the first reading in Spanish? But that may take a few months. <laughs> that may take a while to, <laughs> to happen. So all those resources are just a link away from you. You don't have to translate them. You don't have to look for it, like to do it yourself. They're there. We have them there. Um, there is Anglo priests who say, I don't speak Spanish. So, but we're going to start a Spanish service. But I cannot preach. We have sermones que iluminan, sermons written in Spanish for those congregations that sometimes the priest is not able. Because remember, <coughs> to do Latino ministry, and this is going to be the most important thing that I have to say, to be able to do Latino ministry, you don't have to speak Spanish. Latino ministry, it's about connecting. It's about relationships. <coughs> it's about walking with people. So even, uh, we have so many priests who are celebrating La Misa, and they don't speak Spanish. <laughs> and for the sermon, they just go to sermones que iluminan and read the sermon. Some of them will ask a lay person to come and read it for them. So you don't have to be 100% well capable of doing Spanish to be able to do Latino ministry. There are resources there for you, or for those congregations that are that need those kind of, even study Bibles in Spanish. Bible studies in Spanish, I'm sorry. Um, ideas to celebrate posadas. There was an idea over here from Linda. Uh, and these resources are in English. You can perfectly understand them and see what they're about and make a decision of if we should implement them, implement them or not. So those resources are right here. We have them in our, in our page, latinosepiscopales.org. You will find all this information. And, and this is my last um, slide. Our best, your best resource is going to be us, yeah. the Office of Latino Ministry. Thank you so much for inviting us to be part of this conversation and this dreaming of Latino ministry in Trinity event. Gracias.